Access. I'm your host, Matt. And I'm Drew. So you may have noticed, once again, uh, Drew and I are following, are, are carrying on without our third. Tyler is not here. Now, the reason is funny, okay? He says he has a girlfriend. Okay, he really, he really does have a girlfriend, but I had to, I had to say it like that because it was just in the rules. Okay, but anyways, Yikes. he, he had, he had to go pick up his girlfriend for, for some reason, and apparently, once a Linux nerd gets a girlfriend, he's no longer a Linux nerd and can no longer hang out with his Linux nerd friends. So, and Tyler, you want me to stop talking shit? Show up for the podcast. That's the, those are the rules. Anyways, welcome to Linux Cast. Now that Matt's dug himself a hole. Uh, <laughs> those feet taste really good. <laughs> uh, anyways, welcome to Linux Cast. We talk about Linuxy things. We're going to do quite a bit of that tonight as per usual. But as we normally do, we're going to talk about what we've done this week in FOSS. And Drew, take us away. I worked on my home assistant this week. Uh, I shared a screenshot with you and Tyler. One thing that I can't friggin' figure out is how to get my Google Nest thermostats to work and I'm cons <laughs> I'm considering selling them on eBay and getting something else but uh, my pragmatic wife will likely talk me out of that I wanted to talk about the lug last Thursday because Matt when Matt hosted the lug last Thursday and I thought it was very good and, and there was about 10 to 12 participants the topic was one that we covered on the pod but I thought the overall points that were made were really good and diverse and I just wanted to recommend for those of you who have not been to the lug, it's really a, a good time uh, and a lot of really good information. So, and another thing, generally when Matt closes the lug, he mentions that we're welcome to stay in chat. Three of us stayed in chat for, I don't know, a couple, three hours after the lug. And it made me rethink, rethink some things and led me to my next time allocation. So I've been writing a lot and I don't normally do that. I, I mean, other than documentation, but last week I mentioned that I had uh, about six hours invested in doing a video on installing Debian with the goal of using Snapper. I pitched all six hours and I'm going to restart the whole thing over again. And the reason why is because I'm actually going to write the documentation first and then follow it. And that's, that's the reason why I just, completely pitched the entire thing. The other thing that I wanted to mention was I did do some other writing too, and it had nothing to do with Linux, but in case you were interested, it had to do with critical thinking. And it was one of those things where I just felt like my son would benefit by me talking about critical thinking and how it like how it works and with heuristics and bandwagon effect and the Dunning-Kruger effect and so on and so forth. Anyway, if you are interested, just hit me up sometime on Discord and I'll, I'll send you a link or something like that. I don't think it's appropriate for Linux, but you get the idea. So that's about it. You know, I, like I said, six hours pitched on that video seemed like a ridiculous time suck. But once I get the, the documentation right, I think it's going to make a big difference for those people that will be following it in the video as well. So I think that's a perfect way to do it. So I, but, and, but don't feel bad about your six hours lost because, you know, it's good practice. But also, I've done the same thing. I made a four hour video on how to set up Qtile, never posted it. It was an atrociously bad video, but it could have been salvaged through some editing, but it was four hours long. <laughs> And I was just not going to touch that. Uh, I did the same thing with the the polybar video that I eventually did post. That thing was two hours long. Got it cut I down. I remember to that one actually. Yeah, that was really good. Yeah, it took. I thought you did that live. No. No, no. I, I've done a couple polybar ones live, but I didn't like an ultimate guide where I was where I recorded it. It was oh, okay. like two hours long. I cut it down to an hour long. It's one of my highest you know, viewed videos ever, but the, it would, it just took for, like I recorded it in like July and didn't post it until January. <laughs> That's how long it took me to actually sit down and edit the damn thing. So uh, six hours lost is it's, I always look at it like, you know what? I got six hours of practice. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. All right. So for me, I have been, I've done multiple things. First off, I'm, I'm back to work now. So not as much free time as I did have last week, but I'm still messing around with some stuff. So I've been, so I, I've 
talked about the home lab stuff in the past and one of the reasons why I started on that road was because of, of Plex and stuff and I wanted to start hosting my own music. And my music collection, as I've talked about in the past, is atrocious. It, it's it, it's a collection of both legally obtained stuff and, you know, others. And if you've ever taken stuff that way, first off, don't, because it's against the law. You shouldn't do that. I have to say that for money, you know, so I don't get demonetized. But if you, if you happen to stumble upon it, maybe it fell off the back of a truck or something, and you have it in your library, you'll know that the quality is somewhat dubious at best sometimes. And my biggest issue right now is that I'll listen to one song and it'll be like, oh, that's really good quality. Now, like, I'm not an audiophile, but I want to be able to hear, you know, the song. And then I go to the next one and it's like half the volume or a quarter of the volume. And even though Plex Amp has the loudness normalization thing, it doesn't work. I don't know why it doesn't work. Uh, maybe I'm doing something wrong, but it just doesn't work. So I've been looking at easy ways to get past that problem haven't found one yet but i've the first thing i decided to do i was like you know maybe it's just a plex problem so i tried i've tried a couple different things that right now i'm trying something called navidrome and it is a self-hosted music streaming service that's like a front end for something called open subsonic or open sonic or something like that and you can get there's several clients that you can use it will stream to that and it's very it was very easy to set up it didn't require a database or anything like that it basically is just a system d service after you install it it does not have the best web interface ever but it's not bad it does have some themes and the client you use on mobile is not too bad as well depending on which one you get but Overall, I'm not sure if it's going to solve the problem, but I'm, that's what I'm kind of looking for, is to try to figure out how to get to the point where my music's actually at least somewhat, you know, listenable. Because at this point, I'm either, I'm either going to go in two directions, Drew. I'm either going to delete my entire library and, you know, get it again and make sure all the quality is the same. Or... I'm just going to say screw it and resubscribe to Spotify or Apple Music or something. Those are the two directions I'm at right now. And the Apple Music one is definitely going to be the cheaper, uh, at least at the begin with. But if I, I really do want to have, you know, my own music. Like, I don't want to have to pay $12 a month. And they just keep, my biggest problem isn't that it's $12 a month now. It's that they every six months they raise in another, another dollar. Eventually, it's going to be $20 a month or then $30 a month or whatever. And I, like, I don't. I have no interest in paying that much money for it. Uh, like yeah, I, I'm use using it. the family plan on Spotify. It's you know it gives you six, you know, and I have enough people <laughs> that it makes sense, I guess. But l let me ask you about the Plex. Is it called normalization? I wanted to write it down. Uh, normalization. Okay. So if you're in Plex Amp, it's Plex Amp. I believe Ple regular Plex has it as well. If you go to settings, uh, like I'm looking at this right now, I can't do it with one one hand. And then you go to playback. It is called loudness leveling. Okay. And I believe it's on by default, but again, it doesn't work. Now, I did Google it in, in your Plex server or whatever. There's a there's a place in the audio settings where you can also level to them. Maybe the, those two things are conflicting or something. I don't know. The reason why I was asking you, this is on a Docker container. I'm I'm assuming, correct? The, the Plex is not. It's installed okay. via Deb package. Okay. All right. All right. That's that. I was just because I wanted to see if I could get it to work maybe or something because I, uh, you know, I don't use a Docker container for my Plex. I use I have a, like a dedicated machine that I have that and Nextcloud running on. So I just wanted to see. And I didn't know if that was something because I the Intel processor that I have in it works well with whatever transcoding. And I don't know if that has anything to do with it at all, but just wanted to see. Yeah, mine's in a in a VM in Proxmox. Okay. So I, I have so I have three or four uh, virtual machines. Ones for like the all my Docker stuff, and then I have a, like a storage server that I or storage VM that I use, and I have Plex on that, so it's just easier. So it has direct connection to the to the storage and stuff, having to deal with NFS or anything like that. So that's how I have it set up there. I don't, I mean, I suppose it's possible that it has something to do with that. I don't know. I'm happy with Plex for TVs, shows, and, and movies. For music, I'm less than impressed. The, the best thing about Plex, though, is that it allows you to have multiple libraries. So I have all of my stuff, which is a collection of, like, classical and rock and rap and all that stuff. And then all of my 
family stuff, they're all country people. And I've taken all their music and put it into another library. And that cool. way they don't have to intermix. And I can still make playlists between both of them, which is nice. Um, that's the best part. One of the reasons why I have Plex is for my, my buddies that live out of state. So they can actually watch my local television that I'm like using the over the air <laughs> antenna for. So that they can watch like the Bucks games, the Buccaneers games, friends. Two and O bucks, just so you know. I hate you with a passion. Sorry. <laughs> I, I, the fucking Falcons. I hate them. Oh, sorry. <laughs> anyway, it's good. It's good stuff. Yeah. I, I looked into the HD home run when we talked about it the last time. Yeah. And basically my solution ended up being was just to stick with YouTube TV and get rid of the Google set top box, the Chromecast or whatever, and ended up with a, Pro, the fire cube from amazon it works so good i mean it is astonishingly good how well it does because basically they take you right out of the youtube app and they've just create they somehow have tied into it to make their own guide and it works so good and they put all of your services in there so you, so i have pluto and i have like a couple of the free ones like amazon prime channels or whatever all that stuff and yeah. it goes right along with youtube tv all of it in the same thing and you can use alexa Sorry that I just activated everyone's <laughs> Alexa thing. Uh, then I did it again. <laughs> Anyways, you can just use her to change the channel to whatever you want, to whatever service. It works astonishingly good. It kicks Google's set-top box out of the water. It's yeah. nuts. I I'm very worried, though, <laughs> that they'll send an update to it or they'll just cancel it because they don't make any money on it or something. I don't know. It it's really hard to be relying on something like that and then know that eventually – you know, it probably get yanked up from underneath you. Anyways, I, all right. I, I've been sorry. Just last last point on this one, but I, I had a, a um, an Nvidia Shield that I bought in 2015 that I am right now <laughs> selling on eBay, and I already have a couple bids on it. I don't know why it's it's uh, it's kept its value, but I've just decided to go in a different direction, I'm not using Google TV, and uh, so that's. There you go. I just wanted to see if, how I was like, I'm not going to be using this NVIDIA shield. I might as well put it on eBay. And boy, it's still valuable. Apparently from what I read, that's like the only good like Google TV one. Yeah. Even nowadays, like they have, they have updated versions of them. But, and I look when I just, when the Chromecast stopped working with voice to select channels, I thought about going to that, but it was $200 for the, like the most recent version, I was like, that's just, that's just a little too pricey for me, especially, you know, I just, the, the, the fire cube or whatever was 139. So I saved a little money and I'm very happy with, with, with that. Cool. I still would love to stop paying for YouTube TV. Cause it's like 80 bucks. And uh, like I said, you know, that eventually that's going to go up to, you know, $85 then $95. And eventually I'm going to pay like 120 bucks for just TV. When we used to pay like 125 bucks, you got internet and TV all in one bundle. <laughs> I'm salty about the YouTube premium, you know, YouTube premium is, is, is way too much now. I know I had to pay for that. <laughs> With, I, it'd be great if the, like, if you had to pay for YouTube TV, it'd be nice to bundle YouTube premium in with it. So that it's no like, doubt. you know, like you pay for this, you should get both. Absolutely. But, but no, I, I pay for YouTube TV and YouTube premium. So, that cause the, the ad blockers stopped working and you know, I don't know. And, and yes, DT, I know we're talking about proprietary garbage. Can't help it. Uh, sometimes you just need to watch TV. And unfortunately, it's all proprietary shit. It's just the way it is. O o open source some open source developers bring on something and, and I'll try it. But none's out there yet. Anyways, so that's our weekend FOSS. Let's go ahead and move on to the main topic, which is a topic that came from Drew's selection of topics. So why don't you explain to us, Drew, what you were thinking uh, with this? I think that we all have like must haves <laughs> when we set up our Linux machines for whatever reason, we're just like, I have to have this. And where we talked about windows before, it's like, I have to have outlook with me and Linux. I have to have certain things, or at least I, I mean, I can always choose something else, but I would be really salty about it if I did. So these are one of those things where we are look talking about what we have to have on our current build of Linux and Matt with his open SUSE and me with Debian. So what we absolutely need to make us happy. <laughs> 
Okay, so the first one, I'm let's uh, go back and forth. Like I'll do one, then you do one. Then sure. You yeah. Do it like a little round robin thing. So my first one is going to be uh, NeoVim. It's like the first thing I install. Now I do have like a, a small script. I'll just install most of the stuff, so it's all does does it done at once. But the first thing in that install script is NeoVim. And it's almost like universal these days. I, I take it and I have all my dot files that just links to everything and and set up. So yeah, that's the that's the first one uh, that I, I I mean I don't think that I could use. So if there is a world where like Vim didn't exist, I'd be a sad sad person. Like to have to use Nano would be very disappointing. Like yeah. I, I, mean, I just no, I get that. I, I'm just there. I mean, this I, and I did. I went away from Vim for a, a while. Like I went and used Kate as my primary text editor for probably five or six months, and it was fine. Like Kate's a really good GUI text editor, but there's just something about hopping into a terminal and editing a configuration file inside of uh, of Vim. It's just something completely different. That it's a it's a weird like mental thing. Like like. I mean, they do the same thing. Like, there's nothing that you can't do. Like, you can even turn Vim motions on inside of, of your favorite GUI to text yep. editor. Yep. But um, there, there's something different about going into Vim and editing something, even if it's just one line. May, I think part of it, and this is going to sound like the most elitist thing ever, but I learned Vim. You know, like, like I went through with the effort of the blood, sweat, tears, and pain of learning how to exit vim and doing all the stuff that you need to do vim right in order to actually use it and once you get to that point you have a little bit of pride in you and you want to use those skills that you that you learned and i think that that's the reason why it feels different and i can't really explain all that so vim is my first one i I, i'm with you I, i i put neo vim on every machine that i start off with and is it the first thing I put on? No, <laughs> but it's it's one of the top like 10 for sure. If we're talking about the very first thing, my choice is Debian. <laughs> Shocking, right? I mean, when I think about what I what my first thing that I'm choosing to put on my Linux machine, my first choice is Debian. So, I mean, if you're talking about, uh, you know, the granddaddy of them all, robust, stable, surprisingly unflappable, it's the base of like, a shit ton of other distros out there. It's like my choice and I am unapologetic unpo- about it. Let me ask you a question, Drew. C- is there something that Debian could do to make you not use it? Matt, I don't know that I have the brain cells to come up with something that, you know, that would push me off Debian because I don't know. I'm such a shill at this point. <laughs> when it comes right down to it, I mean, probably not. <laughs> Unless Google bought them or something, then, then, okay. then we're gonna be in a world of a world of shit. But no, no, I don't think so. I mean, I don't know. Okay. The reason why I ask is like, there, I could foresee there being something that OpenSUSE would do that would make me. So, so for example, there's this whole thing going on where uh, the SUSE organization is trying to get OpenSUSE to rebrand. And oh, if they yeah, chose you told a, me about that. If they chose a really stupid name, I probably couldn't use it anymore because I, I, <laughs> I, I can't foresee myself, oh, yeah, I'm a Geeko fan. Because one of the things that they suggested was Geeko, right. right? And that's the stupidest fucking name ever. So if they switched to that, I wouldn't be able to use it anymore because there's no way I'm getting that on a t-shirt. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's, it's a stupid reason, but that it's kind of like that kind of thing. Because like if Debian renamed itself to, I don't know, Ubuntu or something. <laughs> I think it's it, it may be the logo though, Matt. I mean, my God! I know you ripped it right into your logo. So if you had to change, you'd have the to come up with something. The J with the Debian. Oh my God! Okay. And everyone who who has joined a lug knows this is true. Drew and I have talked probably off and on for probably a year or so, and he's had the same logo for quite a while. Oh, it yeah. took me a long time to recognize that the Debian <laughs> logo was actually in there, right? It's it's like like it took I mean like it was always a cool logo, but it took me a while to realize that the little <laughs> spiral thing is the Debian logo. I'm a little slow, okay? A little slow. Yeah, I don't know that I'd admit that, but that's cool. <laughs> It's okay. It's all right. Uh, I'm confident in my slowness, I guess. <laughs> okay, here's it happened the same thing with the FedEx logo. So, you know, the FedEx logo has this arrow in it, and a lot of people don't actually see it. Like, it's there. Okay. So, it's a, I it, never it, saw it, that. 
<laughs> I'll point it out to you later. You'll never be able to unsee it. I have a story behind that, but we don't need to get into it. It's a completely, it's a completely thing. All right. So my next one is what I, I'll, I'll use a, a, a pair of tools. Just they, they kind of go together is OBS and Audacity. Without them, couldn't make a YouTube video to save my life. And you know, like I know some people still use like simple screen recorder to make their YouTube videos. I respect those people, but I couldn't do it. You know, I think that it would just be too tedious to actually go through and do. Even though I do record my audio and video stuff separately, so I'd, the workflow would be basically the same. I'm just so used to the way OBS is, and as much as I complain and talk shit about OBS, it is still fantastic. It's like so good. So I, I think that those two, I definitely, if I didn't have them, I could say I'd just probably never make a video again. So yeah, we're in the same boat because you know we both make videos. So I mean, we have to use we have to use OBS. That's just a, a must. You know, I don't use Audacity at all except for the podcast. That's the only thing I use Audacity for. But I'd still have to do it because of the podcast. If I didn't, if I actually wasn't on the podcast, though, I wouldn't install Audacity at all. But um, yeah, yeah, OBS is a must. Yeah. I'm trying to think if I if I didn't make YouTube videos, would I have Audacity installed? And you're probably right. I probably wouldn't. But since I started making videos, I, I've learned that I need backups of everything. And it's just easier to record audio twice than go through and remember it, the, you know, after you've recorded an hour long video, finding out that your audio stopped recording halfway through, you know. And this way, I always have, if the Audacity thing Fs up, I have the OBS version. If the OBS version Fs up, I have the Audacity version. And I just started that way. And now I, I mean, I, I tried to, so I tried a couple times. Like I was having some Audacity problems, like the flat pack was broken. And I, I just recorded with OBS. And I felt not good doing it. Because it was like walking through town naked. You know what I mean? It, it, it just felt weird. So yeah, th definitely those two. Um, your next one. I, I keep looking at the chat and I am incredibly predictable apparently because <laughs> everyone's pegging everything I'm going to say basically. So DWM. <laughs> DWM is my dream come true as far as a window manager. I cannot, let's put it this way. I can't use a desktop environment. I would be incredibly salty if I had to use a desktop environment. Now, granted, I started off on XFCE. I have tried KDE. I've tried GNOME. I've tried Budgie. I've tried. I cannot at this point get my work done in a normalish fashion without a tiling window manager. And yes, I've tried a bunch. You know, I started off with i3. I went for, to BSPWM, went to DWM, went back to. I tried Awesome WM, I went back to BSPWM, and now I'm on DWM again. And the fact is, it's light, efficient. It, it does require the manual configuration. Not everyone's gonna like it, I get that. But when I, the very first thing I do after installing my Debian minimal install is I install DWM and I'm ready to rock. Uh, so that is my, my next one. So I think Debian is the perfect single monitor window manager. It works very well on a single DWM, monitor. DWM, you mean? Did, what did I say? You said Debian, but... Uh, well, Debian's a, a very good window <laughs> manager, too, okay? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, anyways, DWM is the perfect one monitor window manager. It, it works phenomenally well in that situation. Once you add another monitor, it's okay, but it requires more flexibility with your, your key binding so you can move things back and forth between different tags that exist on different monitors because it uses the same tags on both monitors so you have two sets of nine and as someone who likes workspaces it was fine with two like it works really well with two too as well once i went to three it got way too complicated because i have to keep having to like cycle through them in order to move things where they needed to go so DWM didn't work for me while on, on two monitors. Also, Drew, I talked about this in one of my podcasts, or one of my patron podcasts, one of the things I do, and I've gotten incredibly spoiled by desktop environments, and I feel dirty saying it. Like, I don't, like, I'm a tiling window manager guy just like you are, right? Or at yep. least I thought I was, and I think I still am, but 
since I've moved to using desktop environments, there are just certain things that work better. It, things like having a, a clipboard history manager built in. That's awesome, right? Like, yeah, you can you can add that onto a window manager. It works. It would work fine. But it's just there. It works. You don't have to think about it. It just is part of KDE. I think on GNOME, you have to use an extension. But who cares about GNOME? Nobody uses it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, things like uh, Bluetooth built right in. You don't have to worry about downloading Blue Man or any of that nonsense there, right? Things like uh, power management is way easier in a desktop environment. Things like controlling whether or not the, the screens go to sleep, how often they go to sleep, when they go to sleep, all that much easier in a desktop environment. Things like adding a system tray is a lot easier than in some of them. So, I mean, there's just these, and none of them are huge. Like, none of these are like big deal-breaking things, but once you've got into it and you realize the benefits of some of them, they kind of all add up together to make it really hard to go back to a window manager, even if you enjoy window managers. Um, I don't... It took me a while to get here, though. Like, like when I first went to a desktop environment, I hated it. Like, it was... Like, even now, I... Just tonight, when I was messing around with all this, I talked about I need four monitors. The reason why I need four monitors is because the windows are all over the fucking place. It's like a scattered pile of of shit. Like, it's all over the place. I have... I have two, 42 windows open and yeah i could use workspaces but i haven't used workspaces nearly as much when i on a desktop environment as i did on window manager it's really a weird feeling yeah you're gonna have me. to turn in your uh, your window manager card i think i know I think and i'm very disappointed because i've had i've had that card for a long time yeah <laughs> it hurts a little bit and that's really i think that's one of the reasons why i've been so desperate to try to get back into window managers so i can't so i don't lose this <laughs> so you don't have to turn your card in well no <laughs> well, i mean that too but more just so i don't lose the skills because window managers take skills to do like i tried to redo dwm the other day like I maybe mean, it was a couple weeks ago now and i balked at the first failed hunk you know what i mean like the, the first time one of the patches failed i was like I remember how to do this, but this is just too much work. I'm going back to pay, pay to KDE. And I I used to do K DWM for fun. Like, I used to, like, how, how many patches can I do? Like I got up to, like, 30, 29 or something like that before I, you know, gave up. And I used to do that just like, oh, this is fun. The last time I tried, it wasn't fun anymore. It was, KDE has ruined me. You should try my, my DWM config. And uh, if, <laughs> this would be funny because... Every time it used to be that uh, when Ddubs was trying my DWM config, he would just like, "Yeah, I need a different, uh, I, I need a different patch. Can you, <laughs> can you, can you hook me up with a, a new patch on this?" I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, okay." Then I always upload it, so it's got I don't know, but like 13 patches now or something like that. But it's one of those things too where, like you said, I like having it on my single widescreen ultra widescreen monitor because right now I've got like three panels going right you know right now and i'm using the uh centered master layout for dwm but my normal you know my normal layout is called uh dwindle but this works for the podcast really really well so anyway i wanted to also mention kind of like a an honorable mention when talking about tiling window managers is sxhkd and for those of you who are using, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. If you are a keyboard centric user, having uh, SXHKD to you know manage your key bindings, phenomenal piece of software and super lightweight. Very, very, it's like a secret sauce for tiling window managers. It's a, it's a hotkey daemon that lets you bind all your commands. And it's especially with, I mean, you have to use it with BSPWM. You don't have to use it with DWM, but it's there in case you want to make it really easy for yourself. I only have like a part of my keybinds in the DWM config. And then outside of that, I've got SSXKD also running. That way it's easier just to kind of like throw in a different browser, throw in a different something else, you know? You don't have to recompile every time you change right, the keybinding, right. right? And it's great. It's fantastic if you switch back and forth between different works window managers yep. because you can just take them with you. It, yeah, it's great. I there are alternatives. So if you're on if you're on Wayland, there are alternatives for XHKD, right. but they're not as good. Yep. Don't tell anybody, but they're just they're just not as good. So maybe eventually the the Hyperland guy who seems to be the, the only person who does any work in the Wayland community in terms of window managers. I mean, what the fuck is Sway doing? It's been the same forever. But maybe he'll eventually do a, a hot. That's why it's on Debian because it's super stable and never it never gets updated. 
<laughs> All right. So my next one is going to be Vivaldi. I, I know it's proprietary garbage. I understand. Uh, and I'm keeping my eye on the Zen browser because that's eventually going to be where I go. Once that has tab groups in it, it's going to be right up my alley. And that's based on Firefox. But until that time, Vivaldi is just it for me. Like I am a tab. I'm not the biggest tab hoarder, you know, someone will someone come into the chat every time I say I'm a tab hoarder and then you're like, oh, you have a hundred tabs open. Like, oh, I have 2000 tabs open. Like, okay, you win. Uh, but for me, a hundred tabs is, is a lot. Like, like, I don't think I have a hundred tabs right now. I think I have like 65 or something like that, but still it's a way more tabs than any one person should have open. But the reason why I can do that is because of workspaces and tab stacks. They're so good. Like I, I can organize everything into a subject. So like right now I have like I have my, my main one, which is where I do my main browsing. Then I have one for reading where I put all of the things I do for reading. And I have one for work and I have one for video ideas and stuff like that. All the stuff goes into those. And then within those, I can have tab stacks, which are basically tab groups. So for example, in my ideas workspace, I have a tab stack of a whole bunch of distros I want to look at for the channel. So it's a way to organize within your organization tree. And it's just, it changes the game. And while you can come close to it in stock Firefox, you can either have one or the other, really. Basically, t uh, what's it What's it called? Simple tab groups, I think, is the, the plugin for Firefox. That basically gives you the workspace functionality. And it's good. That's what I used to use when I was a Firefox user. It's not bad. You can do a whole bunch of stuff with key bindings to make it work well. It's the tab stacks that hasn't been able to be replicated on Firefox yet. And I'm still a little worried with the Zen browser because I'm worried that it's just going to be basically a Chrome version of tab groups. And t Chrome's version standard version of tab groups are not good it's just basically all in one page all colored coded and ugly together it's not great so firefox and or vivali is my is is one that i really so you have to have Vivaldi yeah i have to at have this it point. and okay. it hurts me when i can't because there was before they came out with the flat pack it was almost broken every other release for on linux i don't know why it works so well with the with the with, with the flat pack whatever reason it just solved the problem that they were having and it has worked flaw basically flawlessly then uh, it still has this stupid thing on Wayland where it opens up a random icon of itself that's supposed to be in the the system tray uh, but doesn't appear there it just appears in the center of the screen it's really fucking stupid uh, you can close it but it's dumb uh, anyways Vivaldi is mine and it's it's fantastic still proprietary but I'm still yeah, you know, I have to have a browser like everybody. And I don't know that I have to use Firefox. I choose to use Firefox. But I'm like you, actually. I tried out the Zen browser very recently, and um, and I'm impressed. I mean, I like that. I like Florp, for that matter, too. Between those two, between those two projects, Firefox should be stealing a lot of it. <laughs> you know what I mean? They totally should be, like, agree. looking at these guys and go, holy smokes, this is open source. We can start poaching stuff off of their off of their code and and really incorporate uh bury them in a committee somewhere and those features will never appear and also the zen browser and fork will just die because they'll have gone on and get got jobs at mozilla I, I need to not say that out loud because it'll probably happen but that's just but you're absolutely right what they should <laughs> what they need to do is just pay attention like seriously what we don't need to get into the, the Mozilla thing. We just did a whole episode yeah, on that, but they just yeah, need to totally. pay attention to what other browsers are doing instead of just whatever yeah. it is they're doing. All right. Yeah. I did. So one of the things I should have talked about in the, this week in Floss thing is I tried for the last week just to see if I could prepare myself for when Zen browser has tab groups to try the vertical tabs thing. And I hated it. Really? <laughs> yeah. I try. like I tried for a whole week. Now it's not, Okay, so it's not that I hate it. I I I, could, I got used to it, and but it's just so, it was so annoying having to figure out because you gotta remember if you just have one or two tabs, you're fine. Yeah. But if if you have twenty tabs open, you have to go searching through those little icons, and some of them are the same. So you end up I ended up having to tap on several different icons if I had like three YouTube videos open, which I oftentimes do. And it was just annoying. It's much no, easier I get to that. have them. I thought them. the same thing, actually. I think I, I really, I kind of liked it if you were 
having like a sparse number of, t of tabs. But if you got any more beyond five, it seemed like, oh God, what's this? What's this? You know, and so you actually have to hover over it to, to get it to, to give you some feedback so that you can pick the right one. Yeah, I understand that completely. I, I talked to the developer. I'm really hoping that he'll give us an option for vertical tab, for, for horizontal tab. Horizontal, yeah. yeah. That'd be, that'd be so just, I mean, like Vivaldi does, like Vivaldi, you can put them on any side of the browser, all four of them are option. That'd be awesome. Cause I like to move things around. Like every once in a while I'll have them at the bottom. Like right now I have them at the bottom. Sometimes I'll move them to the top if I'm feeling frisky, you know, it's just, you know, it, it, it's good to have the choice. And if that's what the, the, he's trying to build, that'd be awesome to have those types of choices to make things good. Florp has those types of choices, but didn't do a very good job on the workspace functionality. So, but also, Florp also has like the Chrome engine, also like what is it called? I don't even know what it's called, but basically, if you want to, do you know what I'm talking about, Matt? At all? I okay, haven't used it in a little while. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll 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 make a video on it or something and make. Okay. It. So. All right. Uh, your next one, Drew. Well, like we talked about before, if you are doing YouTube videos or certain things, you absolutely have to have OBS and so on. I think GIMP, you have to have GIMP because if you want to create a thumbnail, it's there's nothing really better in the Linux ecosystem to build a thumbnail than using GIMP. It just seems like the right thing to do. It's free, open source. It's powerful. It's not Adobe. I get that. Okay. But... I hope, and it's not a dead project. Let's 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 put that out there in the world that it's not a dead project, even though it seems like they're work they're working at a glacial pace. GIMP is definitely one of my must-haves on my uh, on my new ship. Yeah, I like I I'm a bad GIMP user. Like I can do oh my god, like three things in it, like. <laughs> Like I, I, it's way more powerful than what I could possibly ever need it for. But yeah, I think I'd probably be upset. So for those of you who've been on YouTube for a little while, there used to be a guy named Terminal for Life. Uh, he, used, he used to be learn, learn Linux, right? And then he changed the TFL, right? And he had this, he did everything with bash scripts, even created his YouTube thumbnails with them. And that's my dream. Like I would love to be able to do that. It's just like pop in the the title that I want to give it into. He used like FFmpeg, I think, is what he used to do it because he shared the script with me. And I was like, it was beyond. It was way beyond me. Like I like I know a little bit of Ash, but that was wizardry. Um, but that'd be so cool. Just go pop in a terminal, put in the title that I want, and maybe even link to like the 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 icon or the 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 logo that I usually use in, on the left hand side. Just say here, go make this for me. That would be awesome <laughs> because I'd, I'd happily not use gimp because i'm not good at it it takes me forever to like and and my color sense is just not good <laughs> i always i'm make... wretched at using gimp but i but i i do it because i just need a thumbnail that's all that's that's the extent of my abilities though that's like i push myself to get a thumbnail that's whatever 1280 by 720 that's that's all I can do, you know, and it's not even that good. I mean, your, your, your thumbnails are like significantly better than anything I've ever done. So, you know, I, I'll tell you a secret. I stole them from someone else. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> no, that's no. the Linux way, though, isn't it? Well, no. okay, <laughs> so I, I should be more fair to myself. I didn't actually steal them. I emulated someone else's. So, and I'm not going to tell you who. If you've ever seen someone else's, in the, it's, it's literally it's in the Linux community. I'll give you that much of a hint. Okay. And it's not they're not exactly the same. I put my own twist on it, but I liked the slash thing across the, uh, the side so much that I I stole it. So. Shh, DT's in the chat. Shh. I uh, I did not steal it from DT. I did do a couple DT style ones because his his were his were always so cool. But I will uh, first off, I couldn't emulate the face on like I, I can't do the face on the the thumbnails. I just can't do. It. I did it on one recently, and it was felt weirder than fuck. Right, and so I can't do that. Um, also, I can't emulate the bald head. I just have to have hair. Yeah. <laughs> is Calibre. So this is actually a recent one for me. I like I didn't use to use this, but since I got into the whole home lab self-hosting thing, I've been self-hosting all of my audio or all my uh, DT is not both, by the way. I just, it's in the contract. You have to say it. Okay. Anyways, the, um, I, I think I, I'm next, right? Yes. So my next one in Kavita, I think that was the name of it. And 
in order to, for that to work, you had to do a lot of editing of the metadata. And I just, in order to do the editing of the metadata for series on Kavita, you had to use some either Vim or Sigil. Now, Vim wasn't too bad, and I, but the problem is I didn't learn you could use Vim to edit an EPUB file until, like, the end. Before that, I had to use an application called Sigil, and this, this is a, an application that is astonishingly old and feels that way. It doesn't, it, I think it's like, I'm, it, I think it was like written in QT like 2 or something. It's very, very, uh, uh, maybe an overestimation, but it, it was it's very, very finicky. If, if you left, if, if you lost focus of the window, it'd delete all of your progress unless you'd made a save. It was really weird. It worked better in KDE than it did in GNOME. Um, and, you know, so there's a whole thing there. Um, anyways, I spent, I probably edited like 500 books that way. It is so much easier in Calibra. You just hit a button that says edit metadata. At the bottom of that, it says get metadata. It will fill all of it in for you. It will show you the covers and their dimensions so you can choose the one with the best resolution. It will put in all the tags and ISBN and uh, genre and the summary. And all. And if it's part of a series, it will properly number it. It is astonishingly good at that. And then add on top of that... You can send it to if you have if I use Kindle to read all of them because it's just the easiest way to get it to the to the phone or to the Kindle or the iPad, and it will if you set it up properly you can use your email to send a book from Calibre to Kindle, and that's like magic because you don't have to use like a I don't have to pull out a, a, a USB cable in order to put the books on there, that's really good. It's just a fantastic piece of software if you're into self-hosting your books. If you're if you're not and you just buy all of your books through Kindle, which I understand, I was that way for a long time, uh, this probably is not good for you. And I will say this, the bog standard out-of-the-box UI of Calibre makes you think that the person who developed that and the person who developed XFCE have to be related. Because the okay. vanilla version of XFC, not good. The vanilla version of Calibre, not good. But just like XFC, you can go through and make it look basically however you want. And it's very, very good. I do have a video on Calibre, by the way, coming up sometime uh, this upcoming week. So if you, if you guys are interested, subscribe to LinuxCast. There you go. Hashtag YouTuber. All right. <laughs> Shameless plug. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hit <laughs> smash that like button. <laughs> I can't even say it without coughing. Also, somebody someone did a, like a meme or whatever when someone said smash that like button and they like punched their monitor or something. <laughs> All right. Anyways, uh, Drew, your next one. Well, you got to have a terminal. <laughs> so if you, uh, in my world, if you have to have a terminal and you're choosing your terminal that you must have, I choose Tilex. It's one of the things that actually, I think I got from you, Matt. If at some point you were big into Tilex and I was like, yep, that's the one I want right there. That's the one I want to use going forward. I haven't deviated from that in more than a year and a half, probably. And uh, it's, and, which is strange because typically I am not afraid to just doing a configuration file because I do it for BSPWM and DWM and so on. Tilex does not have a configuration. It's just simple, use the menu system and you know massage it to the way you want it. And it's freaking awesome. I really love Tilex. It's one of the things that I absolutely have to have every single time I start out. Yeah, it is a fantastic terminal emulator. I, I don't use it anymore, mostly because I'm on KDE. And well, it looks fine on KDE. Console does both, most of the stuff exactly the same way. So, but yeah, if especially if you don't mind GTK applications, it is by far the best GTK emulator out there. Now, I know George Castro is out there somewhere saying, Matt, what about this Texas thing, PTXYIS, whatever the hell it's, I can't pronounce it. They really need a different, desperately need a different name. Uh, that's the ter default terminal emulator on Bluefin and Aurora and all the universal blue stuff. And it's good. But it's not as good as Tilex. It's just not. And, and now, granted, if you're more into the container stuff, the one for in Bluefin is better. Um, but if you don't need any of that stuff, Tilex is is astonishingly yep. good. Um, I wish it was better maintained. That's like that's the biggest downside. Like I just wish it was slightly more uh, maintained than it is. Sadly, it's not. Uh, anyways, uh, my next one. So I'm gonna go. Oh. Yeah, I have to do this one. Another piece of proprietary garbage. I'm sorry about that, but I use I use Todoist as my to do to do to do list application to do list manager, whatever you want to call it. 
and for one reason only. It's not that it's the best to-do application ever. It has natural language recognition or something like that and has had for years. Basically, what I can do is say, I need to uh, go to the store next Monday. So I can re go to the store next Monday and it will say, go to the store and then it will schedule it for next Monday. And that's awesome. And you, you can be as, at, you know, you can say it in many different ways and it will recognize the date and the time. You can also use hashtags and at symbols and stuff like that to put tags on it and put, put it in projects and stuff like that. And it's great. I don't pay for the, the professional, the, the free version has been good enough for me. There is a, it, it is not native to Linux. It's an Electron application. So you'll have to deal with that if you're into it. But I'm surprised, I, Matt. That's because you really have like this. I don't know, aversion to anything that's that's Electron. I, I mean, do. I even use Discord in the terminals to avoid the Electron version is that of right? Discord. Okay. Yeah. Huh. Mainly because, I don't know, I've, I've had conflicts with Wayland and, and Electron applications, on, especially on window managers. But I, the to-do application is something that I have to have in my face. Like, that thing has to be in my face or I'm not getting anything done. I'll spend the entire day on YouTube watching... Anything that catches my fancy. So if my to-do list application is always right there in the corner and it's pinned there, it's not going anywhere, it's always on top, and it reminds me to do the stuff that I have to do. And I, I, I started this in 2020. So before, before 2020, I didn't keep a to-do list application at, at all. Like I, I tried a few times, never stuck with it. Since January, it's actually a, a new year's resolution that I've, I've stuck with for four years. It's, it's nuts. Basically, I put that there and it makes me do stuff. So... Just a random productivity tip, and this is going to sound stupid. So if anybody's actually ever seen, I don't think I've, I, I think I've avoided putting my to-do list actually in any videos because a lot of times it has work stuff on there, but there's also some embarrassing stuff on there. So this is a product productivity tip. Put if you want to, if you have a hard time getting started in the morning, put something you know you have to do at the top of your list, like brush your teeth, put your pants on, or take a shower. Something you know you're going to do every single morning because the first thing you can do, you can just go brush your teeth. Then you can check that mark right off and you've already made progress towards your day. You're going to do it anyways. You might as well have a thing. So, so the first thing on my list every morning is to brush my teeth. It looks stupid because like, of course you're going to brush your teeth. You don't need that on a to-do list. But just the mental thing of being able to check that first thing off at yeah, 8 o'clock in fair. the morning every morning. It has changed my life because I get everything done on my list because it's just once I have the first one done, oh, well, I can go do the next thing. I can go to the next thing. It's just – it's completely – I could do a whole productivity channel and it would be – that would be the only tip I'd probably give. Because um, <laughs> <laughs> otherwise, I'm not productive at all. I, I do this – if it's on my list, I'll do it. But if it's not on the list, fuck that shit. I ain't doing it. Anyways, Drew, your next one. Well, you already talked about a – sorry, a text editor that's in the command line. I like micro, by the way, just putting that out there. Anyway, I use Genie like 90% of the time. And then you know, the other 10, I might use like either micro or, or NeoVim. But 90% of the time I need a text editor, I'm using Genie. And I granted, it's not, it's not the, I don't know. It, 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 there's a lot of people that will say, Kate's just as good. I don't agree, okay? Kate has a lot of you know, flexibility and stuff. I don't know. Genie is just my jam. I remember sending you a long document about how I set Genie up because it, in one video that I did, it was showing my Genie and maybe a configuration file. And you're like, that looks really good. It 100% is the way you set up Genie, which will allow you to say, oh my God, I can't live without this. Okay. And for me, it's Genie with the plugins that are like completely like hand selected. I want that plugin and that plugin, including the Git change bar and a couple other things, the add-ons for color and so on. Anyway, if you ever need a good text editor that is a GUI text editor, use Genie. Go to my website at Just a Guy Linux. Shameless plug. And there is a document which will tell you exactly how I set up Genie with the plugins that I'm using. It's very, very good. I cannot live without it. So I did eventually go through and set up Genie like you did. I just don't think I used it long enough to get attached to it. Mainly because I'm a Vim guy and Vim was there on my shoulder saying, uh, use me, use me, use me. So eventually that got me uh, back to Vim. Um, but in comparison to, to Kate, I'd say you're probably right. The genie is better. 
Kate has the KDE problem. And that's just... I can't use anything QT, dude. I just can't. I don't know why. It's just something in my head that says, don't do it. Part of Kate's problem is that it has the KDE problem. It has so many options, so many things you can do with it. It's kind of like QOM notes. You tried QOM notes, right? And I Q have. Yeah. QOM notes has, I mean, so much going on. And it's a fantastic note taking application. It has a ton of features. You can sync it with Nextcloud. You can do all these things. You can move the UI around so you can, you know, do whatever. And Kate's kind of like that. But sometimes you just need your thing to work and be fairly simple. Yeah, yeah, I want options, but I don't need every option under the sun. Like, I just don't. So, I, I don't... Kate, I liked Kate. I used it for several months, and I got to a point where, you know, it was working really well for me. But it took effort. It was kind of like adding patches and stuff to DWM over time. Like, you know, you just kind of had to do it, and it was fine, but it just wasn't for me. All right, so my... Next one is going to be, oh, see, I, I want to say Crusader. Like, I really do, because Crusader, so Crusader's a file manager, it's fantastic, but I haven't used it in months. Like, <laughs> so, so it's not a, it's not a must no, have then. No, I know, but see, so for a long time, it would have been on this list, but it has been so buggy the last two months, I haven't been able to use it. The drag and drop stuff has been completely broken. Things have just been crashing all over the place. I don't know what I think it's. I think it's a Wayland thing because it kind of coincided with me using Wayland all the time. So it might be a Wayland thing. And I think that you can have it use Wayland. It just doesn't do it by default. But even that didn't fix some of the problems. So I haven't been using uh, K Crusader. Instead, I'm going to list Dolphin. All right. I, uh, Dolphin is. N uh, it's not my favorite because Crusader still has the my heart, but because it's so buggy, I have to I had to have something else. And Dolphin has a lot of the features that Crusader has, but not all of them. And it does it in such a way that it remains better than anything else that I've used. I like I like Thunar; it's fine. Uh, but I've had some problems with Thunar on on KDE. He works great in a GTK environment. It doesn't work as as good on a QT environment. So Dolphin is like the thing. So really my point here with this one is I need a good file manager. No matter where I'm at, I need a good file manager. It varies where I'm at. Sometimes I use Thunar. Sometimes I use Dolphin. If Crusader was thing, that's what I'd be using. So the, like those three are the ones that I, I rotate between. But I, if I had to stick with like Mac OS's Finder or Windows Window Explorer, I would probably die. I'm just <laughs> like, like it's... I need a good file manager. It's literally my most used application outside of the browser. I have that thing open all the time, and it, I can't show this really well. But right now, in, in Dolphin, I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, uh, 10, 11, 12 tabs open now. Oh, wow. All right. For file manager, I think that's quite a lot. And Holy all crap. of them are, are dual pane, so they have... Each one of those have two, you know, panes in them. And so I have like 24 different files open all at the same time. And I love it. Like, it doesn't seem to be very organized. It's not as organized as it was in Crusader. Because in Crusader, two panes was the primary way you did things. And then the files were open on side by side and you could switch between them. In Dolphin, the tabs are isolated and you can kind of have to switch back and forth between them. So you kind of have to have different combinations of tabs. It was not quite as good. Uh, but other than that, a good file manager is an absolute must for me. So, yeah. yeah. No, I'm with you. I, I think Thunar is like my absolute have to have. Um, it's been that way for a really long time. I know that you've used Ranger in the past. I don't know if that's something that you used like for like a long period of time or anything or just did for video maybe. But Ranger is really good. And NNN and LF and all these like, you know, command, uh, sorry, yeah, terminal uh, file managers. Excellent. I, I, tend to not use them because of my skill level. That's the only reason that I don't use them more often. But I know that Ranger I've tried, but I end up always back in Thunar just because I'm just, that's a comfort level thing, you know? So I do use a terminal file manager all the time too. 
Uh, okay. I mostly I use it in like from a home lab because I don't I can't it's it's easier to just SSH into the home lab and then use a file manager that's actually on the machine instead of having to that makes sense basically put you know get into the the GUI for it. I use Yazi. Yazi is awesome. It's like Ranger, but faster and better in almost every way. Now I will I think say Dubs has told me about Yazi a million times actually. Yeah, it's very very good. I will say that the configuration part of it is not as easy as Ranger because Ranger is all done basically in one file. And in Yazi, there, it's split into three different files, so it's a little bit more compartmentalized. And it, it's more of a – I think it's I, it's either TOML or YAML. can't remember which. It, it's one of those. And you, so you still have to pay attention to syntax and stuff where you don't really have to do that in, in Ranger. But it is – it's just great. It's it's a fantastic thing. And if I didn't have to have drag and drop, I probably would use a terminal file manager all the time. Okay. Drag and drop in a terminal file manager. And someone's like, oh, drag. if you use Dragon, you can get drag and drop from a terminal file manager. Trust me, it's just not as good as a standard GUI file manager when it comes to drag and drop and stuff. Especially the outside of that applications and tabs and stuff. It's just sure. So anyways, uh, your next one, Drew. So I have been thinking about not including this because it kind of like makes me look a little, I don't know, it, 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 it loses a little uh, Linux street cred when I say I use GitHub desktop, okay? It is an open source, it's, it is an Electron um, application. I use it all the time because I'm just not good enough to, to use like Git in command line very often and it just it's like a comfort thing for me so every single time this is a must-have for me because of my own inability to use git in command uh in command line so i use github desktop it's uh on it's on github there's a guy by the name of uh shift key who builds out this particular version of the github desktop that i use and it's uh it it's it saves my bacon seem seemingly all the time. Okay, I have one more. My, my last one is actually not a Linux app. It's actually an iOS application, and it's not open source. I, I did a lot of freaking proprietary stuff tonight. Yeah, I don't. I don't know what's going on with you. I know. I I, I, <laughs> I, I use proprietary software, guys. I'm sorry. I know it loses me some cred when it comes to op being an open source, you know, evangelist or whatever they they call me. But sometimes you just like it's really hard to find an open source app on iOS. It's I'm sorry, it is. Yeah, that's fair. No, on like the the Linux, I use on, on the Linux. <laughs> Anyways, the the app I'm talking about is called Reader Five, and it's actually I think it's called, got just got changed to Reader Classic because they they changed to something completely different for a do, a new version. The new version is atrocious. First of all, it's subscription based, and it doesn't work with fresh RSS. So I use fresh RSS for all my RSS feeds, and uh, Reader Five is how I read all of those things, and it is awesome. I mean, it's just so good. So I guess I can I can actually put a fresh RSS as the pick here. Because it's you know the back end for it, it is it, it got me back into RSS. Like I I had dangled my feet into some RSS over the course of the years, and I used to be really big into it uh, back when Google Feed or Reader or whatever used to, I can't remember what it's called. Google used to have their service for feed for RSS feeds, but since then I really hadn't done it. But you told me about fresh RSS, and I got into that, and since then. That's how I get all of my news, all of my YouTube stuff, all of my fan fiction stuff. A whole bunch of Reddit feeds are pro popped yeah, into that's, there. That's awesome. Yeah, it's just, I mean, I probably add five or six different RSS feeds to that thing every week. Like, if I see a blog and it has an RSS feed, I'm going to add it to Fresh RSS. And also, just blog writers everywhere, two things. First off, if your blog doesn't have an RSS feed, I'm not going to ever come back to your blog. Sorry, not sorry. I'm just never going to do it. I'm just going to forget about you even existing ever again. Uh, and second of all, like, look, I understand you want to bring people to your site to read the content, probably for advertising reasons. But if you give me three sentences of your blog post in your RSS feed, I'm going to unsubscribe to the RSSing because <laughs> it's completely useless. Like, like, you need the teaser, Matt. You just... <laughs> Give me a cut. Like, okay. So like I can understand, like I, I, I want to make money off my content too. So I, I understand not wa wanting to put the whole thing in there, but I, I adore people who do, but at least give me a couple paragraphs, you know, like, let, let me get, get the hook in there and, and let me know that, Hey, you know, I, I want to read this thing enough to, to, to click through it and go read it. 
three sentences ain't gonna do it. You know, it's just not gonna. And the thing is, like, there, there's, there's, there's one Linux blogger that I that I read. I'm gonna butcher his blog's name. It's like Dedo Miedo or something like that. It's like a Spanish, Spanish Russian, something, something like that. He he talks about Linux all the time. And for whatever reason, his blog, his feed setup is is three sentences long. And I'm like, no, I'm sorry. Half the vast majority of time, unless I'm really, really interested in the title, I just mark it as read and pass it on by. It's really annoying. So yeah. Anyways, fresh RSS and uh, Cl Reader Classic on iOS. So there's tons of different RSS readers out there to go with it. But fresh RSS is just oh, it's so good. Anyways, uh, Drew, your last one. So I've got three more that I can hit in about 30 oh, seconds. That, no, you don't, okay. have to, you don't have to rush. I, it was just I'm out of them. So <laughs> Okay, no, no, no. So basically there's two that are the same, v VLC and MPV, okay? And you got to have one or the other. In my case, I put both on there. And the reason why is because, like I've said a million times, I use a tiling uh, window manager, DWM, and one of them, VLC, I actually use just normally so that it shows up in the tile as, as a tiled application. And MPV, I use as a pop-up basically in the middle of the screen so that it, you know, so that I can see it like in its, you know, in that aspect ratio. So I like having both of them, both of them. I like having both, both of them. So anyway, the other and the last thing I was gonna say is I always install MKV tool nicks, okay? And there is a bunch of, there's a bunch of parts to this. So MKV tool nicks allows you to have MKV merge, MKV extract, MKV info, in MKV prop edit. It is incredibly flexible tool. And if you're like me who cannot use Caden Live at all, okay? I store all my little snippets of my videos in MKV format, and then I use MKV merge, which is part of this, in command line, and I construct my video using that method. So that is my absolute have to have. I have to have MKV merge to do my videos, so there you go. I use MKV tool nicks. By the way, it also includes uh, MKV tool nicks GUI, as part of that, I just don't use the GUI package that's part of the installation from Debian. I just use MKV Merge, but there are a lot of other kind of utilities a part of that package that if you're interested, you know, the, like for example, the MKV Prop Edit edits metadata and properties of MKV files without re-encoding it. So there you go. That's really cool. All right, so MPV would have been on my list probably six months ago. Because it's awesome, and that's how I watched all my movies. And th so there's there's one line that you can put in your MPV MPV config that will basically have it every time you close it, it will remember it will save a log of where you were in that particular video. And if you ever come back to it, it'll remember your position. And if you watch movies in MPV, it's deal -bro. It's like it's just so good you can just go if you watch you can have watch half of oceans 11 come back to it later it'll remember where cool. you were no it's i don't do so that good. yeah that's cool since i started using plex i don't use mpv as nearly as much as i used to but yeah it, mpv is fantastic all right so yes nate we know we went over an hour sorry we you, we could go another half of an hour if you'd like i'm sure we could come up with some other things that we can't live without you know <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Tro trolling the editor is probably not a good idea. I, okay, I, I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> He's probably going to give me a mustache throughout the whole thing, and not the good kind. <laughs> All right. Anyways, or just not edit the podcast, which would be not good for me. All right. Sorry. I'm sorry, Nate. Don't, don't, don't quit. <laughs> 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 anyways moving on to the last uh, section of the thing now it, it's gonna be really weird because we just spent an hour talking about applications that we wanted to you know recommend but we're gonna do nuggies anyways so uh, the last episode la the last part of the episode we talk about our tips tricks applications that we want to recommend we call them the nuggies because my friends love trolling me um so uh drew your nuggie of the week yeah, I mean, this is, again, we talked about, the, the stuff that we talked about earlier was all must-haves. These are kind of like, yeah, throw these in there as well. So the Nuggie for me is a feature on Nextcloud called File Drop. 
And that's something I knew that you would love, Matt, because you, you're all about the, uh, the little things ab about Nextcloud that not everybody knows. And File Drop is a feature that allows users to upload easily to a designated folder without requiring that person to have a Nextcloud account or a login or anything. You just set it up and you say, hey, drop it there. You just send them the link. You know, you just send the, 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 whoever you want to, to drop that 50 gigabyte file into your Nextcloud instance, and it, it's just there, and which is really stinking awesome. So let me give you the example. Let's say a content creator, maybe a podcast host, had a Nextcloud instance and sent the other guys on the podcast a link that he wanted you to drop your MP3 files into, he could do that. That would be an interesting and excellent <laughs> use case. Is, 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 that, is that a hint? <laughs> let, let me ask you a question about this, Drew, a serious question. Can it go the other direction? So like, can I put something in there and have them be able to download it? Yes, but no, it, that would not be called file drop. That's something else. You can actually limit the number of downloads. There's some really good, I can't remember the name of it, but actually I used it, this as a uh, nuggy of the week at some other point uh, a few weeks ago where you can say, okay, here's a link to this file. You have a one-time download or two-time download, or you can actually set up a, a expiration date so that yeah, they... I, yeah, I remember that one, but I, I, I think my end up, my problem is I don't have Nextcloud set up properly because I have there's some kind of like file in it. So every time, cause Nate and I have tried to set oh, it up. So remember we that, talked about this. There, it's in the PHP. We can talk about this off camera, basically. Yeah, but I'm aller I'm allergic to PHP. By the way, <laughs> I break out in hives anytime anybody says PHP. I, I do. Ne I need to fix it because I, I, Nate and I have tried several times to make it so we, instead of using Google Drive to send the do the the podcast to him, we use use Nextcloud. But I have like a 512 megabyte limit on there, and he can, yeah, he can, it's in your download. PHP uh, I and I. It's it, it can be changed. Yeah, one of these days I'll have to have you walk me through that because the the like I said, I'm allergic like. Like everyone thinks I hate YAML the most. PHP is worse for me. And it's not even like the, the language is bad. I'm just, I'm not good at it. All right. Anyways, uh, my nuggie of the week is primarily for desktop environment users. I, I It may work okay. Like if you're in a window manager, you need to change an icon for something. It will probably work for you, but you're probably not going to be in that situation that often. But if you have like a menu system and it uses icons, and you want to change one of those icons, what would you do? Well, I'm sure there's a command line to do this, but there's a program called Main Menu, and you can open this thing, and it will allow you to change the icon and all of the data f of any entry in your menu system. So if you wanted to change the name of Vivaldi to Browser, you could do that. If you wanted to change, uh, if you, for whatever reason, needed to point a, a menu entry to a different executable, you could do that. If you wanted to create, let's say you had a script that you wanted to put in your main menu, that you wanted to have access to your menu, you could create a menu entry for your script with an icon pointing towards the executable, and you could, then you could go to your, your menu and just find that script. It's very good. I found it because there's a lot of icon packs for KDE, which are not complete, which I would say is every icon pack. And uh, none of them have all of them, especially a lot of them miss Vivaldi because, you know, probably because it's proprietary. Um, so I can use my menu to go in there and put a matching icon in there for Vivaldi or Todoist or whatever. And that way I have a matching set of icons. That's what I use it for. It is very good. Like whoever came up with, like there, there was someone else. There's another version of this called Menu Editor. I, that's for GNOME. Main menu works for both. So it's very, very good. Anyways, so those are the nuggies and that's the podcast. If you want to watch us live, we do this every Tuesday at eight o'clock PM Eastern time or thereabouts. We're always late, like always late. Like, I'm just going to be honest with everybody. We're at least 10 minutes late every single time. So if you're a little late, you're not going to miss too much. But anyways, every Tuesday, eight o'clock PM Eastern time, find your own time zones because I don't know the math. It's just not, you know, not going to happen. Anyways, uh, youtube.com slash linuxcast. If you want to watch us live, it happens every Tuesday. So there you go. If you want to get in contact with us, the best way to do so is to find the email address, which is email at the linuxcast.org. 
And uh, there you can, if you need to get in contact with Drew or Tyler or me or whatever, you just label it such as, and then I'll forward on to whoever it goes to. All the rest of the contact information is at, is at the linuxcast.org slash contact. Drew has a YouTube channel where he makes YouTube videos about Linux and open source stuff and window managers and Debian, obviously. And he has an awesome logo to go along with it. You can find him at youtube.com slash justtheguylinux because he is, in fact, just a guy. It says so right in his bio, by the way. Anyways, that is it for this one. And we'll see you uh, next week. 